Hey, my name is Dr. Gerald Dirks, and I'm from the state of Kansas in the United States. As far as my biography goes, I'm the oldest of two children, uh, raised and born and raised in the state of Kansas. As far as my education, uh, I have a bachelor's degree from Harvard College, Harvard University, a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School, Harvard University, a Master of Arts in Child Clinical Psychology from the University of Denver, and a Doctorate in Psychology in Clinical Psychology from the University of Denver. Uh, I was raised in a small rural town, a close-knit family. Uh, my mother was a, a registered nurse, and my father was a laborer who did assembly work. Well, uh, after I received my doctorate, I worked in, in the field of clinical psychology, um, both in terms of um, research uh, in the areas of psychosomatic medicine, but also in the performance of psychotherapy. Well, I, I suppose one would have to say many, many years before I became a Muslim. My, my first introduction to Islam was during my freshman year at Harvard when I took a course in comparative religion from uh, the late Wilford Cantwell Smith, whose area of specialty was Islam. Um, but I have to confess, at the time while I studied Islam, along with many other religions, I really didn't pay a lot of attention to it. It, it seemed so similar at that time to what was then my own Christianity that, that I was much more interested in studying something that was sort of exotic and very different from where I was coming from, you know, Advaitistic Hinduism or something like that. No, no and, I, and I didn't know any Muslims at that time. So to, to get back to answering your question, many years later, um, my wife and I were raising Arabian horses and we needed to get some uh, Arabic hujahs translated. These are the testimonials of purity that came with the horses that were brought here in 1906. And at that point, we made contact with uh, an Arab Muslim uh, who was living in Denver, Colorado at that time. And he agreed to do some translations. He came out to our farm and saw the horses. Um, and then he did something very, very wonderful in hindsight. As he was getting ready to leave, he glanced at his watch and he said, oh, I need to pray. Would it be okay if I used your restroom to, to wash? And we said, sure. And he came out from the restroom and he said, well, would it be okay if I just unfolded that newspaper on the floor so that I could say my prayers? And we said, of course. Now, throughout the course of that meeting, he never said anything to us about, I'm a Muslim, you're not, or preached to us about Islam. But his behavioral example spoke volumes. So that was our, our introduction to a Muslim. And over the course of the next year, Jamal did numerous translations for us and invited us over to his house for meals. We invited them over to our house. He introduced us to probably another half a dozen Muslim families living in Denver. And we began to socialize with these people on a regular basis. And in fact, within six months or so, we were spending far more time socializing with our new Muslim friends than we were with non-Muslims. And over the course of the time, I, I was deeply impressed with how I saw these Muslims living their lives. You know, alhamdulillah, my first contact with the Ummah were shining examples of how to live Islam. And the more I watched them, the more I said, you know, what? What, what's giving them this? And so, without saying a word to my Muslim friends, I started pulling off my library shelves all the books on Islam that I had from that course in comparative religion many, many years before. And I started rereading them. But this time I wasn't reading them to pass a course. This time I was reading them to try and figure out what made my Muslim friends tick? What made them live the sort of life that they were living? 
And so I exhausted those books, probably about eight books, all written by Western scholars on Islam, and then began reading English translations of the Quran. And I read uh, uh, Brother Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation. I read Marmaduke Pickthall's translation. I read another translation. I wasn't a person who was going to rely on just one translation. And the more I read, the more I had to ask myself, now, how do these beliefs differ from my own? Because having come out of uh, Harvard Divinity School, uh, and having been an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church, you know, I, I had been exposed to what the earliest manuscripts of the Bible said. I had been exposed to early church history. And as a result of that, you know, I did not believe in a trinity. I did not believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was the Son of God in anything more than perhaps a metaphorical sense. And so I started asking myself, now wait a minute, how are my beliefs different than Islam? And I finally had to conclude they really weren't. But nonetheless, at that point in time, I was unwilling to give up my identity of being a Christian even though I considered myself to be an atypical Christian. And, and this went on, man, the struggle for several months. In fact, I recall one incident at a, a cafe in Denver that was uh, a, a Syrian food cafe, where uh, the waitress, who was an American Muslim, uh, saw that I was reading an English translation of the Quran as I was waiting for my meal to come. And she very nicely said to me, are you a Muslim? And I immediately said, no. And about that strongly and vehemently. And I said to myself, my goodness, what, what am I doing? You know, this young woman asked me a very innocuous question. Why did I answer it that forcefully? Well, as a psychologist, <laughs> knew that, you know, I was unconsciously accusing myself of being a Muslim, but I wasn't willing to change my identity. And so if someone asked me, are you a Muslim? I developed a long sort of song and dance answer where I would say, well, if you're asking me whether I believe there is only one God, my answer is yes. And if you're asking me whether I believe that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a prophet and messenger of God? My answer is yes, but I'm not a Muslim. I'm an atypical Christian. And I kept building on that. And Ramadan came, and I said to myself, well, you know, all my Muslim friends are fasting, so I'll fast too. Uh, before long, I, I was doing the five prayers uh, in English every day. But and I found them spiritually rewarding, but I still maintain I was an atypical Christian. Uh, I was an atypical Christian who, in English, had said the Shahada, who was fasting during Ramadan, was reading the Quran in English translation, uh, and was saying the five prayers daily in English translation. But mind you, I was not a Muslim. So I thought I had it all worked out. You know, I could have my cake and eat it too. And then my wife and I took a trip to the Middle East, and uh, we were staying at the home of one of our Arab friends in Colorado. And at the home were their aunts and aunt and uncle, neither of whom spoke any English. And uh, of course, my Arabic was limited to you know, salam alaikum and nam and la, and you know, a few simple words. And uh, one day, uh, Uncle Awad motioned for me to come with him. And he took me to a Palestinian refugee camp in Amman, Jordan. And we got out of the car and we started walking down the narrow lanes. And as we were walking one way, an elderly gentleman approached from the other way and came up to us and said, Salam. And he also spoke no English. And he turned to me at that point, and I knew just enough Arabic to understand his question. His question was, are you a Muslim? And here I was. <laughs> you know, I thought I had it all planned out, but the Quran tells us who is the true planner. 
and I was put into a position where I couldn't do my long verbal explanation and end up saying I'm an atypical uh, Christian. I was put into a position where I either was going to say nam or I was going to say la. And those were the only two choices I had. And alhamdulillah, at that point, I said nam and, and finally uh, embraced the identity of Islam. Uh, there was some negative reaction from um, within the community in which I live, as well as from some non-Muslim friends, uh, and also from some uh, business associates. Uh, but very much positive response from uh, my Muslim friends. Uh, the first year after I became a Muslim, uh, I lost probably about 50% of my income. Uh, the Muslims that I knew at that point were all wonderful examples of Islam. So that certainly didn't change afterwards. I continued to have contact with them, etc. But I did then come into contact with the wider Ummah and, and discovered that not all Muslims were such shining examples of Islam as were the, my initial friends. Well, I would point to three things. One, um, on an intellectual basis, uh, I, I was impressed with uh, the strict monotheism that is found in the Quran and Islam. And uh, quite frankly, coming from my background, uh, seminary background, um, there were things in the Quran that, quite frankly, no illiterate seventh century Arab could possibly have known. Uh, and that was jarring uh, to realize that fact. Um, but also, uh, Islam's message of love and Islam's message of brotherhood were, were on a more emotional level, uh, strongly motivating forces. Well, first of all, let me hedge my bets in answering that question because I wonder whether there is an Islamic world, really. Uh, if we define an Islamic world as uh, a world or a community or an ummah in, in which everyone is, is practicing Islam, I'm not sure that exists, quite frankly. Um, as far as uh, the so-called Muslim countries of the world, uh, I've had the opportunity of living in Jordan for over a year, and, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, and many, many uh, valuable things, I think, exist there. Uh, the way in which families care for each other, um, the extended family concept that is there, the fact that in, in my 14 months living in Jordan, I never saw a nursing home, you know families cared for their elderly. Uh, those are beautiful things. Um, on the flip side, um, every strength is a weakness in some ways. And the focus on extended families, etc., uh, creates what social psychologists call a collectivist culture. And in a collectivist culture, very often it's more who you know than what you know. And everything becomes based upon sort of tribal and family alliances as opposed to actual skill and merit. In contrast with, say, the Western world, uh, which is an individualist culture, and everything's based on what you know, not who you know. In the Uma, I I'm going to speak about the Uma in America primarily. And I think the major problem that we face as an Ummah in America is one that we as an Ummah create. And that is the failure to differentiate between culture and Islam. So we have many Muslims from all over the world living here. And they each bring their home culture with them along with their Islam. And to a great extent, I think, fail to differentiate what is their home culture and what is Islam. And the problem this creates is, is not a problem for themselves necessarily, 
or for converts like you and me. But the problem it creates is for the second generation of Muslims in America. Because the children of these immigrants are born and raised in America. And if you ask them, what's your nationality? They'll tell you they're Americans. You know, doesn't matter where their parents are from. They're Americans. And if we do not differentiate home culture from Islam, we can very easily end up creating a situation where the youth feel that they have to choose between being an American and being a Muslim. And if they feel that's the option given to them, quite frankly, we're not going to like the answer they give. So I think this is the major problem. Failure to separate home culture from the religion of Islam. Oh, sure. First of all, the Western world gives Latinized names to, to many of these uh, Muslim scholars. And they talk about them in their history books, but they give them Latinized names. And they're never, it's never mentioned that they're Muslims. So Ibn Sina is known in the West as Avicenna. Uh, Ibn Rushd is uh, known as Averroes. So the, the Muslim identity uh, of these people is obscured. Uh, or not mentioned. Uh, another example, one that uh, might be closer to your own heart coming from Mexico, is that there's a very famous person that came with the conquistadors named Estevanico of Azamor. And, and Spanish language movies have been made about him. Um, yet his real name was Mustafa Lamora. And he was a Muslim slave uh, from uh, Morocco. And that he's one of the great heroes of uh, American history. Well, again, I think uh, on a macro level, the, as I mentioned before, um, the Middle Eastern cultures are primarily collectivist cultures. Uh, Europe and the United States are primarily individualist cultures. Each has good and bad aspects to being that way. That was being done every minute of the day by almost every Muslim in America. Because whether by name or accent or dress or grooming, we're all recognized as being Muslims in our home communities, at our work, at our schools, etc. And people look at our behavior, they look at all of our behavior, and rightly or wrongly, fairly or unfairly, they say that behavior is Islam. So we're always doing dawah. The only question is, are we doing good dawah or bad dawah? Personally, I think the most effective dawah that any Muslim can do is one's behavior. You know, the example of Jamal and my uh, first meeting of him. Um, but little things, is, it can be many different things. But people look at us, and if, if our behavior is right, if our behavior is correct, if our behavior is admirable, we're doing dawa, and we're doing good dawa. Um, on a more formal basis, in terms of discussing uh, Islam, I think it's important to make the first step when I'm finding common ground. So if you're talking to a Christian, it's important to show the common ground between Christianity and Islam. Um, you know, you can even quote Bible verses and quote the parallel verse from the Quran or from the Ahadith, etc. Because once you establish the common ground, then the listener can begin to identify with you. And if they identify with you, then they're going to be much more receptive when you do start talking about the differences that exist between their religion and your religion. Unfortunately, I, I think some of our brothers and sisters want to begin the discussion with the differences and want to start that discussion by saying, you're wrong. Uh, and that is not an effective way to do dawah. Well, certainly Ramadan Mubarak, but uh, also inshallah to remember that uh, Ramadan's more than just uh, refraining from food and drink and the intake of substances from um, dawn to dusk. Ramadan is also supposed to be a time of 
spiritual reflection of uh, devoted reading of the Quran.